Our strategy remains to be significant in the UK and to try to contribute, you know, to the progress of the energy business in all its different components, which is uh, the same strategy that the EDF has in France. In fact, the UK is kind of a special place in EDF as a, almost if it were a domestic market for our company. So uh, there is a strong uh, preference to remain relevant and present in different segments to participate to these uh, challenges globally. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm John Feddersen co-founder and chief executive of Aurora, and I'm extremely excited about the discussion today. I'll be speaking with the CEO of UK's largest generator of zero carbon electricity. He's an executive of Europe's largest zero carbon electricity generator, so across all of Europe, and also, I'm told, Europe's largest renewables generator. He's also an accomplished clarinet player, with a bachelor's degree to show for it. So he wasn't just fiddling around on the weekend. He actually studied for a number of years uh, the clarinet. He's a former McKinsey consultant. Uh, My guest on the show is Simona Rossi, CEO of EDF Energy. Uh, Welcome, Simona. Thank you, John. I know this sounds like a silly question um, in the UK, but could you just say for our international listeners, listeners, what does EDF Energy do? Well, we are a generator of electricity here in the UK, about 20% of the electricity. Uh, We also supply electricity and gas to customers in the UK with about uh, 18% market share for the large business customers and about 10%, just shy of 10% market share for the retail market. Uh, We are also um, building a new capacity station at Hinkley Point uh, and uh, we are developing a sister power station in Sizewell. Uh, we also own a business uh, which is called Podpoint, which focuses on uh, um, uh, a network of uh, charging points for electric vehicles. And we own another business which is called um, Imtech, which is a, um, a active in contracting and facility management across across the UK. And last but not least, uh, we have a renewable business here in the UK and internationally as well, uh, part of which is running, in fact, wind farms, but we are also building new wind farms onshore and offshore, as well as solar. Mm-hmm. So so absolutely at the heart of the energy transition in the UK, uh, whether it's networks and, and you know charging infrastructure, generation, retail, all, all of those things. Um, and we'll get into we'll get into those specific parts of the business, hopefully in short order. But before we do, can I just ask you? I mean, it's an interesting background that you you focused on playing the clarinet. Um, I suppose early in your education, what was it that convinced you that you didn't want to pursue music anymore and that you wanted to go into into business? Well, to be honest with you, you know. Uh, uh, being excellent in music, it takes a lot of talent and a lot of ambition and a lot of everything. And I was probably a little bit short of some of those components. Yeah. And uh, and uh, and at the end of the story, I said, well, if all goes well, I might be, end up maybe teaching clarinet. But I said, you know, perhaps perhaps I was actually more genuinely interested in other in other um, avenues. So at some point, uh, I, ca- I tried to keep going for a while, but I was rehearsing with some friends who were a bit more serious than me. And eventually, mm-hmm. you know, I, I thought it would be better for everybody that I actually, yeah. you know, step down. <laughs> okay. No, yeah, no one wants to be the weakest link. Yeah, it sounds That's a little it. bit like my maths degree. <laughs> uh, I, I did it and then uh, I realized I, I didn't have the talent and ended up as an economist. So, so there's no, not, not only in clarinet, I think. Um, one, one other aspect. So you've, you know, EDF is a massive international business, obviously um, part owned by the French state. You took on the UK role. Why, in as far as it was your decision, why 
why did you decide to take on the UK role? And and within that, could you say a bit about how important the UK is within the the whole the whole EDF group? So the UK is about ten percent of the overall EDF group. Uh, maybe a little more when it comes uh, to investments, or maybe a little less when it comes to employees. But you know that's the order of magnitude. Um, actually, I you know I did take the role that I had because I was asked. I was asked to, so that's a real simple question. So yeah. the, my my boss, the the the, the chairman uh, of EDF in France, asked me to take this job, uh, which I I did very gladly because I knew it, uh, having been educated already in the past between 2011 and 2014, and uh, knowing the market, how vibrant it is, and how important it is for EDF to succeed in this market. So yeah, I'm very pleased to have this job. Hmm. And do you think so? So your your predecessor, Vincent de Rivas, he's you know his legacy. I think for a lot of people, I'm sure you know he did a lot of things, but his legacy was around Hinkley C and getting it to getting it to financial close and, and commencing construction. How much do you feel like your legacy in this role will be about delivering? Hinkley C. You know, when they tapped you on the shoulder, did they say, Simone, great, there's a retail business to run, there's a whole bunch of assets to 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 run. But what we need you to really do is deliver Hinkley C. Well, it looks like you were there at that point in time. Exactly. <laughs> say that Jean Bernard Levy told me, Simone, uh, Britain has invested its trust in EDF to deliver Hinkley Point C. And uh, uh, I'd rather they do not regret this choice that they've made. So that's your mission number one, and that yeah. there is everything else. But that's really very important to me, uh, 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 very important yeah. to all of us. Uh, it's a commitment to the country, really. So that's absolutely the most important thing. And I told to Vincent, uh, you know, you did the, the, the difficult bit, which was actually to structure this deal and to prepare it, et cetera, et cetera. We just need to build it now. So, you know, <laughs> it's actually rather easy compared to what he to yeah. what he did. It- it perhaps it, 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 it may the irony that it's harder to get get it to financial close and to actually build a three point two gigawatt nuclear reactor. Yeah, maybe we a just bit need of to in, build it. That's indictment it. on the whole, <laughs> the whole process, but it was a slog, wasn't it? Um, when you look back on that 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 period of time, and I, I would add, Simona, I mean, I it feels to me like Hinkley C has. It's not just the UK, right? This has implications for the energy transition globally. Uh, you know, you look at what happened. You know, you look at the Im- implications of Flamanville uh, in Finland as well uh, of the of the same same similar design and some of the delays. And I think, at least from my perspective, you can't help but think delays there set back enthusiasm globally for the next next wave of nuclear reactors. So I think my my sense, at least, is if if you can deliver Hinkley C on time and 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 working well, it has pretty big implications globally. It does. It does. Well, just one more point on your on your journey. Um, so you have two daughters, um, and it seems at least like the energy sector is thinking pretty hard about, you know, inclusiveness and and diversity and those types of things. Do you see impediments at the moment to your daughters, for example? No, they may not want to. They may want to do the clarinet or something else like that. But do you see impediments to them pursuing a career? in the energy sector at the moment based on their gender? I really do not, honestly. Uh, But you mentioned, you may be, the biggest impediment is their perception of this industry, you know, uh, as they form their own uh, views of the world, their appetite to do one thing rather than the other. Uh, And I think, so maybe the biggest impediment is our ability to talk about our industry in a manner which is appealing Mm. also to to girls or or to females. Uh, at EDF here in the UK, we have about 30% female representation in our workforce, which of mm. course is, you know, I is suspect low. That's, uh, I and, suspect that's above the industry. I mean, it's it's low, but it's above the industry. Yeah, average, but, you know, uh, I can see, you know, there are pockets in our company where the gender diversity is really struggling. Uh, clearly in our customer business, it's better. But if you go into some parts of our nuclear generation business, for historic reason, and particularly in the upper ranks in the company, it's much lower. Uh, and I and I can see, I would say we are really convinced, we touch it, we experience it every day, the lack of diversity of thought, the lack of diversity of thought is a big hindrance 
to our business. Yeah. It's a big interest to our business. That can come from, you know, gender diversity, can come from all sorts of diversity, frankly speaking, you know, cultural backgrounds, all sorts of stuff. But gender is a big one. Yeah. And the evidence of, of the, va at least from, from my reading of the academic literature, is the evidence of the value of that sort of diversity of opinion is is very high and, and, and in, in, in probably in our industry un, under, undervalued in general. Um, but it has been great on the podcast to have a couple of trailblazers as well. I always think, you know, uh, you know, role models are good. And we've had had Emma Pinch back on recently as Juliet Davenport, who are both, uh, yeah, both impressive trailblazers. Um, okay, good. C can we shift the focus to talking about EDF and your agenda? Just out of interest, how has COVID impacted EDF? Well, in a couple of manners, the first is actually an impact in France. Uh, a ve there is a very large program to upgrade uh, uh, and extend the life to French nuclear stations. Uh, and, you know, when you work at these stations, you've got literally thousands of people in confined spaces. So uh, in this manner, COVID has imposed restrictions. And therefore, this type of work has been disrupted. It's, it's been slowed down. And this has meant that not just for this year, but certainly for next year, and frankly speaking, we're not out of, out of the woods yet. So we'll see what the impact is going to be, but there will be a lower availability in the French nuclear fleet because this work will take longer to do. Uh, and that is a big impact because the French fleet actually has a big weight, uh, not just in France, but in Europe and through the interconnections also to the UK. That's the biggest impact. Uh, as a result, rather than trying to produce about maybe close to 400 terawatt hours of nuclear energy in France every year, this year we, we will be, you know, uh, between uh, uh, 315 and 320. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't even remember the latest uh, public release, but, you know, that's the order of magnitude. So a big shortfall in volumes. The second impact is uh, uh, mostly here in the UK in our large business supply uh, uh, activity. Uh, we've incurred uh, steep losses, I have to say, from the unwind of hedges uh, for customers whose consumption, you know, uh, dropped suddenly at the moment of lockdown. Um, we are very exposed to very, very large customers uh, of all kinds. And this has uh, uh, meant that we had purchased uh, electricity for them to consume that they was not consumed. So we had mm -hmm. to, you know, sell it at a loss on a very depressed wholesale market. And last but not least, we have a, a question, well, more than a question, is actually a reality on bad debt uh, in our uh, supply business in general terms, particularly in the SME part where unfortunately businesses are uh, you know, disappearing as a result of this huge crisis, but also in the residential market where you know, we, we, we are very conscious of the fact we are in front of us, we have in front of us a, a winter season where probably unemployment will begin to, to bite. Uh, so people will probably struggle, you know, to pay their bills. Mm. And have you, uh, when I spoke to Juliet recently, and her, hers is predominantly a retail business, she said, too early to know on the retail front. We, you know, haven't seen major issues, but, you know, as you foreshadow, um, you know, rising unemployment, less government support, you know, would, would be correlated with, with, with yeah. bad debt. Are you seeing the signs or, or is this more about, you know, I, wait and see and anticipate? It's uh, very much as Julia said. So it's mm -hmm. uh, really very early. Uh, we see some signs, but they're not particularly indicative. It's, a, it's more the logic to say, look, right, you know, one way or another, you know, uh, there will be uh, uh, an increase in, un in unemployment. Um, exactly what the implications of that are going to be, how the, this will going to impact, for how long uh, uh, will the economy be able to reabsorb some of that soon enough? These are all questions. So, so we don't know. But for the time being, we do, we do experience uh, some uh, but that issues already on the business side uh, yeah. of the business, which for us is quite sizable. So uh, we we are already impacted, uh, and on top of it, we have concerns and questions uh, about what the impact is going to be in our retail business. Yeah, 
Interesting. It, it, it segues. One question I, I, I've t- sort of had for a while about EDF energy strategy in the UK is, as you say, you're 20% of the generation, you're 18% of you know bigger business customers, a bit less on the retail and those, those types of things. It seems at least in this country and frankly across Europe that there's a movement away from vertical integration, that you've got um, specialist supply businesses, retail businesses, the, the bulbs and the octopuses and the and the um, the the uh, others like that, I suppose, Ovo, those sorts of guys. And then you've got specialist generators, uh, you know, SSE, SSE as you know, Drax, they've got some supply business, but they but but I would say they're long generation. Why why is your strategy different from others? Why, why have you opted to maintain the, the, the vertical integration approach in the UK? It's a very good question. So we keep, we keep asking the same question ourselves. You know, are we the last of the Mohicans? Are we a dinosaur? <laughs> is it just a legacy of where we are coming from? Uh, um, is it a hindrance to be integrated in a way? Or should we rather, you know, move in a different direction? Uh, um, so uh, this, this is an excellent question. I would say that uh, our strategy remains to be uh, significant in the UK and to uh, try to contribute um, you know, to the progress of the energy business in, uh, in all its uh, different components, uh, which is uh, the same strategy that the EF has in France. So, uh, and in fact, the UK is kind of a special place in EDF uh, as a uh, as a, almost if it were a domestic market for for our company. Uh, so uh, there is a strong uh, um, preference to remain relevant and present in different segments to participate to these uh, challenges globally. And we we what we need to do. My job actually consists in trying to make sure that this is uh, uh, an advantage uh, and an opportunity, and it, it doesn't become a hindrance. Yeah. Yeah. And presumably, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, just to just to drill a little bit deeper on that. So you you said you know a whole bunch of people would have hedged power prices ahead this year and bought it at a price that's well above what we've we've observed. Presumably, you bought less for than you might have otherwise because you've got a bunch of generation. Do, do, do you think EDF is protected more from the sort of COVID price dip than? than others because of that vertical integration? You know, if, you're a supp- if you're a supply business yeah. that doesn't generate and you've hedged no, everything actu- full? No, know. no. You know, we, we actually run the businesses at arm's length, so we are not, mm-hmm. uh, we are not uh, internalizing as it, as it were volumes. We do, we do do a little bit of it in the outer seasons. So, you know, uh, season five or, you know, uh, three or four or five years out, we do yeah. have customers occasionally that you know prefer to secure some some power uh, at a given price for which there's no liquidity in the market, and in that case we are in a position to do so internally, if I may say so. Yeah. Uh, but uh, for the rest, uh, we very much run uh, the two uh, businesses uh, uh, independently, and particularly in our large business segment, you know, we really have a policy to you know hedge our positions in general. Mm-hmm. Um, very good. Now, you, you talked about uh, Jean Bernard Levy saying Simone Hinckley C, and we talked about the implications for the world. So I suppose the question you probably get asked more than any other is, where are we with Hinckley C? But I'm going to ask it to you anyway. Where, where, where are we? Uh, obviously, you probably don't want to put a timeline on it, but but is it progressing as you as you'd like? Uh, broadly speaking, I would say yes. Now, clearly, these massive projects. Uh, you know, um, uh, present uh, uh, challenges of, of, of all sorts. Uh, it's not easy. <laughs> it would be surprising if it were easy. Yeah. Uh, um, what I'm happy about is uh, maybe a few things. The first is that uh, the way in which we are building in Clipoint C incorporates a number of innovations from previous CPR projects. If you see, you know, learnings from previous mistakes uh, or optimization, and we are seeing these innovations working and delivering as expected. For example, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we've lifted uh, the cap of the liner, which is the bottom part of the reactor building in one piece. This has never been done before. Uh, so we've created the workshop where these uh, liner caps are produced, welded together. We have a much better outcome in terms of safety and in terms of quality, and also in terms of schedule 
That is to say that we can do those operations whilst we work on site on other things. And once the component is, is ready, we lift it in place. We are also doing a lot of precast, uh, precast surfaces, precast plafonds, etc., which again allows us to put in parallel some some of this production. So uh, we will see, you know, the first moment of truth will, will be at the dome lift of unit one. Um, uh, um, this is uh, this is something for which we have uh, uh, clearly all the data and the re and the return of experience from Flamanville and from Okiloto. Uh, and I think we are we are ready. Uh, we are we are in a in a good way, uh, or oriented to do much 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 better than these previous sites in mm -hmm. terms of performance. Of course, it's still in front of us, so we need to remain prudent. You know, the project, etc. The second thing is that we've been able to keep uh, the project going through COVID lockdown. Uh, that was not easy. Uh, that was not a foregone conclusion. Although I have to say, we did have to slow down. We had to reduce the number of people on site. We had 5,500 people at the moment of the lockdown, and we had to reduce at below 2,000 for um, a couple of months and then gradually uh, began to come back. So um, we kept going um, uh, with our critical milestones, uh, but some of the work at the end of the year will not be done. We, we just couldn't do all the work that we, we're planning to do. So. Uh, exactly what are the implications of this COVID remains to be seen. We are presently doing a piece of work because COVID has affected also some equipment manufacturers that are in Britain or mm -hmm. also elsewhere in Europe, in Germany, in Spain, in France, etc. So as the lockdown uh, hit, uh, a number of factories producing equipment for Anchor Point has been shut or have restarted at a very slower pace. So we are trying to pull together a picture to see what the impact of this is there will be an impact, uh, uh, but let me say, hopefully it will not be uh, dramatic, uh, but I have to be prudent because uh, mm. uh, I was uh, on the phone this morning with, with Stuart on the, uh, and we were discussing about some of the recent upward trend in COVID cases and the, 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 the need to put in place additional measures. Uh, you know, we don't have a furlough scheme anymore. So in, uh, in, back in March, uh, some people were happy to go home and be paid at home as opposed to go to work. Yeah. Uh, that's not the case anymore. So, you know, so now people really want to come to site uh, at a limit, you know, there is a risk. What if they want to come to site even if they have symptoms? Or they, so mm. that, that, that creates a risk on our side and on the communities around the site. So we need to be very, very serious about that. So uh, we'll be very cautious about it. Interesting. Do you have a sense of so we often make a lot of the domestic input into these into these projects, and 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 from a British perspective, I think that's seen as a positive. Does it increase the resilience? Having a local supply chain does that increase resilience to something like COVID, or or having a diverse international supply chain would that be you know would that be desirable in general? It's from a, a it's a, it's a, I would say. Uh, I think it's not uh, such a big difference, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, of course, having diversity of suppliers for the same equipment would be ideal. Yeah. But the nature of our activity means that this is only true for a small part of our components. Some components have, I would say, unique suppliers. Yeah. And, and, you know, the lockdown happened, you know, pretty much everywhere in the world. And so pretty much everywhere there has been an impact. Uh, in general terms, I would say there is a, an element of resiliency of being in Britain, which is more linked to the logistics, to the transport, and we are doing the, uh, whatever we can to maximize the, the UK content, which is uh, about two thirds of the investment. Mm -hmm. uh, and we think we can do a bit better than that. For example, in size, we think we could go to uh, around 70%. Um, uh, that in itself is a is a good measure that gives us resilience to other things such as I don't know, you know, Brexit complications, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But yeah, you know. yeah, interesting. And we will come to size well in a second. Can you just say, is there a is there a simple answer? As to, you talked about costs coming down and lessons from Finland and France and and uh, that are applied here. Why is it so much cheaper to build a nuclear reactor in, say, China than it is in the U? And, and it looks to me, at least, and again, you know, you need to, off with these things, you need to get into the details, but it looks like it's about 30% of the cost um, to build a, a, an equivalent or similar reactor in China as it is in, in, uh, in Europe. What drives that differential? 
So two things. The first uh, is labor cost. So when you see a nuclear plant, you say, oh, cranky, lots of equipment, lots of concrete, lots of steel, etc." Well, that's true. But that's not really the cost. The cost is the cost of people. Um, mm. The people behind it is, uh, uh, you know, tens of thousands of people that yeah. work to deliver the station. And, uh, and clearly, you know, uh, well, the cost of salaries in China is significantly lower than the cost of salaries yeah. in, in the UK or in France. So that is the very major component. The second component, however, is what I would call repetition. So very much like in sports, it's a matter of training. So if you are well-trained and your muscles are fit and you are repeating your task for the 10th or the 20th, et cetera, et cetera, time, then you, uh, you would, uh, um, you know, you would put, chances are you, you would perform better, you would be slicker, faster in solving problems, etc. cetera. So, uh, and this is a, you know, a challenge for us because we are actually restarting this industry here in Europe. And, and many of the issues that we face, we face them for the first time in a long time, or maybe for the first time in absolute terms, because some of the aspects are, are brand new. Uh, and, uh, where, you know, China has been on a, on a building spree over the last uh, 20 or 25 years, and looks like it's continuing. So uh, that is a second factor, I think, which okay. explains this. And so you can't, it's not a global phenomenon. We can't learn in China and apply that in the UK. I'm sure there's a bit of that. It needs to be a, a European learning curve, you, you think? It needs to be. And in the UK, as, as I said, you know, uh, what, we, what we see on Inkley Point is that we have two units. We're building two units. And when you look at what we're doing on unit two, actually things are about 30% faster or more productive than unit one. And you see crikey you know why is that you know well you know there is there's already a big learning impact from doing mm. the same thing the second time is a huge learning impact there is also an element of let me say design stabilization because in the first unit you hit all sorts of maybe open points or small questions and etc cetera, etc cetera. you've got all sorts of issues to resolve in the second unit you take them as solved but that's why we are looking at unit three and four because for us, the project at Sizel is actually a great opportunity to repeat mm -hmm. what we have done already, therefore to embed all these improvements uh, and, to, and to build knowing already uh, at a detail level what we are going to build, which is, uh, which is a, ma a massive advantage. And in a sense, that would be the way to really get these learning curves underway. And that's a really the only way to bring uh, the economics uh, of nuclear under control. Mm -hmm. can, can we talk? So, so good to just dr drill into that a bit. We've seen recently the Wilfer project, the Hitachi one at Wilfer. They've they've stepped back from, or you're potentially sort of just can't cancel the the whole thing. They still own the site and and and, and things like that. Um, and you're you've you know you presumably you're incurring a bunch of costs on size well C in the hope that. Um, you know, there's a framework for taking things forward. When when do you think we'll have the sort of framework in place that would enable you to start to deploy capital seriously at size well C? Or when do you hope, I suppose? <laughs> well, I <laughs> hope, uh... That's probably a difficult question. <laughs> it's a very difficult question because uh, in terms of where we are, we are we're about where we were more than one year ago. So I have to say, you know, it's a big disappointment from my mm -hmm. point of view, because uh, uh, in July 2019, government published a consultation document for uh, financing of new nuclear. Uh, and we haven't seen an answer to this consultation document yet. And we are in October 2020, uh, uh, which means that on this front, there has been zero progress over this period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I have to put that into a context. There have been a general election, you know, uh, changing government, Brexit, the Secretary's change of state change also uh, after all that, when uh, when uh, the Prime Minister, you know, kind of reshuffled this government. Uh, and, and, and then we got into the pandemic. So, you know, we yeah. just, we, we, we can't, we can't ask for miracles. Uh, what, what I can tell is that now I see encouraging signs of really, you know, active engagement uh, with the government officials, with the you know, various uh, 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 counterparts. So we, we, we now know that the issue is being looked at very seriously. And what I really would like to have is uh, an answer, mm -hmm. possibly a positive answer to say, we intend to do it and, you know, and therefore 
we know here is a framework to finance it uh, or, or, or vice versa. But, you know, uh, the tendency would be to maybe uh, postpone and wait and see uh, maybe why don't we wait until in point C is delivered and then we decide that will be too late. I'm mm -hmm. afraid because uh, in order to be able to transfer lessons learned, you, you, you need to dovetail one project into the other. And, uh, and, then the, and afterwards, there is a risk that, that some obsolescence sets in and you can't replicate the design of some components are not available anymore. So it, it's a bit complex. I mean, it's a decision that uh, really has a clock ticking on it. And, mm. and the funding question is the mother of all questions. And, and I really want to have uh, you know, a, a sense of direction before the end of the year. Okay, yeah, and we've got a white paper coming up, so maybe in there. We actually have Dan Monzani from Bayes on the show uh, after the white paper is published. I won't tell you what date he's on the show, and that made you move around, but, uh, <laughs> but, but he is committed to come on in the, in the week or two after it's, it's published. We've got, we've got something penciled in, I think. Can, can you flip just maybe, I don't know if there's merit in flipping the question around. It's not when do you hope to get an answer. It's like if, if there is no answer, and if we're in this, and if you don't get clarity either way, how long do you hang? How long do you hang around? You know, Hitachi's gone. Is there a? Can you think about it that way? Which is how long are you prepared to wait without an answer? Uh, it's a good question. We have, uh, um, you know, a cap uh, on our uh, development expenditure um, that we cannot exceed, uh, and we will not exceed. And um, you know, with the current trend, uh, this uh, you know uh, ends. Uh, Depending on a number of things, could end, uh, you know, between the end of 2021 and mid 2022, just to give you an idea. But at some point, you know, we will have no option other than, you know, really shutting down the project because we run out of funds. So uh, we certainly we don't want to to be in a position that uh, we've been ourselves in the past and other developers where, you know, you pile up, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, money, money, money to mm. develop a project in good faith and eventually it doesn't get done for whatever reasons. So, uh, you know, I think, I think uh, generally we have all the elements for a decision to be made. So there's no reason for this decision to be postponed. Yeah. Uh, so I think really the time is now. Okay, interesting. Or uh, potentially, if there isn't an answer now, that's a that's a that's a fairly bad sign, I suppose. If if all the ingredients are there to make a make a decision, um. So, just one other question um, before we move into the move, in, move into move into asking you about overrated and underrated concepts. So, EDF Energies recently published a document titled "Our Plan for a Green Recovery" uh, to deliver jobs and support decarbonisation. This is about building back better out of COVID. You earmark a, a fairly astonishing fifty billion pound investment um, figure. Uh, presumably, uh, you know, from EDF Energy in the in the right context, that's 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 possible there. Could you just w one thing you focused on is green hydrogen in the in the document? I'm, just, I'm zooming into a specific bit. I'd encourage listeners to read it. There's, you know, they talk about uh, EV charging and the role there. They talk about um, big infrastructure and job creation and things like that. But on the green hydrogen bit, it feels to me like. You know, so for the French government's committed hard towards green hydrogen and something like seven billion euros. The German government's done the same. The Spanish government's done the same. The British government is hedging bets a bit more between green, which is made from renewables, and blue, which is made using carbon capture um, and sequestration technology. How do you see the role of green hydrogen in the UK, uh, particularly given the, the sort of subsea capability we have for storage, storing carbon emissions that, say, our, our, our friends on the continent don't have? Yeah. Well, our focus will be on green hydrogen, I have to say, and uh, in particular on the electrolysis uh, in two forms. The electrolysis that can be coupled to renewables or you know, to any form of electricity for that matter. It could be also electricity for nuclear, of course. Uh, as long as electricity doesn't emit uh, a carbon in the first place, uh, but also in the high temperature electrolysis, so electrolysis of steam, uh, which uh, uh, has the potential to be more efficient. Uh, why I'm saying that? Because, you know, when it comes to decarbonizing electricity, you know, John, uh, clearly the renewables do a fantastic job. Uh, decarbonizing heat is much harder, isn't mm. it? And uh, and when you think about the nuclear power station, is actually you know, it's actually a Bobby. machine that produces heat, and you know uh, we choose 
to transform all the heat that we can, which incidentally is, is around a third of the overall heat into electricity because of the you know, uh, 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 thermodynamics laws. So two thirds of the heat actually go into the sea. So uh, is there something better that we can do with this heat? And the answer is probably yes. So, uh, uh, so we are studying uh, presently ways uh, to uh, use uh, some of the low carbon heat, uh, which is produced uh, uh, abundantly in a, in a nuclear power station and to, and to divert it, to uh, uh, feed into processes such as uh, hydrogen production, which would be of a higher efficiency electrolysis. So potentially to mm -hmm. be cheaper than the classical electrolysis. And the second is uh, direct air capture. Now, direct air capture needs to be coupled with a carbon storage system. Yeah. Uh, once again, having low carbon heat can make direct air capture solution work and therefore become a machine that absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere. These are very interesting concepts which could make the nuclear business carbon negative. Interesting. Yeah, hugely interesting. I mean, there, let's see, there's a there's a a year ago, nobody was talking about hydrogen in at least in my interactions. And now um, I, I think people are finally twigging to the fact that, as you say, uh, using heat, um, storing storing energy is going to be vital if we're going to talk about net zero. Uh, so uh, I think watch this space. And and I would encourage everyone to, to, to get out there and have a look. It's called Our Plan for a Green Recovery um, EDF's document. What massive scope, huge huge investments, um, and and some interesting thinking there on on what needs to happen next. Um, Simona, before we wrap up, I'd, I'd like to ask, you put to you. I put to every guest some 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 concepts and ask you if you think they're overrated or underrated. Uh, and the best type of answer is a one word answer where you either say overrated or or underrated. Um, so let me fire away. I've got five concepts. Uh, the first is the role of smart devices, including electric vehicles, in providing flexibility to the power grid. Do you think it's overrated or underrated? Underrated. Okay, very good. And and you would you would you you have an informed perspective on this uh, given your your charging and battery investments as as, as well as your retail well, business. I, I think it's underrated because it's still small, and I think it mm -hmm. will become bigger, and we will have to learn to use it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Interesting. Um, second concept is international utilities ones that operate in multiple jurisdictions. I'm talking about, you know, 10 plus jurisdictions, really, not, not sort of just two. Do you think there, it seems like capital markets are rewarding the likes of Orsted and RWE and, and people that have wide ranging renewables ambitions. Do you think uh, they're overrated or underrated as a concept? I think they are overrated. I think it depends on the business. You know, of course, if you have a global renewable business, it is an advantage to having a local renewable business when you do maybe large offshore wind farms, etc. But, you know, uh, what we can observe here in the UK, you mentioned some of our competitors. And, uh, you know, I'm not afraid to say that some of them are quite excellent. You know, mention Octopus, for example, or others. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, even too, admittedly, also they are also opening up, you know, to multiple jurisdiction now. But, yeah, Texas, I think, was the latest yeah, one. Yeah, of course. Yeah, but you know, they, um, you know, the local focus for me is the most important thing in our business. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, in the power sector, electricity doesn't move around very easily. It's, mm. it's as simple as that, and and therefore, and they, and they, and the political communities are yeah. the most important ones. And the politics is still uh, turns around uh, countries or nations one way or another. So I would say uh, to me, maybe you can you can be multiple jurisdictions, but that doesn't make a difference. The difference that can make is to be more local uh, yeah. and more and more uh, precisely fitting the, the local needs of a specific uh, country or nation or context. Interesting. Yeah. And I can imagine, you know, the stakeholder engagement and the political engagement required to do something like Hinkley C, it just feels like, at least from the outside, you couldn't possibly do that if, if you were, yeah, and maybe that, maybe Hitachi's learning that, but, but, you know, possibly um, if you were, if you were, if you were coming, coming in for a single project. Mm. Um, okay. The third, third concept is en energy company setting 2050 targets or long-term decarbonisation target. We've seen BP do it, obviously, they're, 
I think the news last or recently was that their share price was at a 25 year low, um, you know, for, for various reasons. Do you think um, the idea of energy companies setting net zero targets, you know, well beyond the lifetime of the CEO and the board is, um, is overrated or underrated? It is clearly overrated. I think that there is a lot of posturing and declarations, etc. Uh, there is a lot of greenwashing in, in general terms, you know, companies purchasing renewable energy, but not really being renewable energy, but rather mm. renewable certificates, etc. Yeah. So there is a lot of posturing and, uh, and I think it's uh, uh, way overrated. Okay. Thank, uh, thank you for being definitive on that. And uh, Juliet Davenport said something very similar on, on the, on the, on the, on the topic of uh, greenwashing uh, recently on the show. Nuclear fusion. Do you think that's overrated or, or underrated? There's obviously not much of it at the moment. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I think it's uh, clearly underrated, at least the nuclear fusion that happens in the sun, because we can do more <laughs> with the photovoltaic. Uh, but it's maybe overrated, the one that happens on Earth, because uh, it hasn't happened yet, and maybe one day it will. So it's a, it's a great, uh, great uh, dream to have. But, you know, I think it's one that belongs to the domain of research. Uh, in uh, in whatever way is done, I know you are in in Oxford, and I know there are you know also uh, kind of startups and and you know companies having projects etc. So I think you know this is still in the, the domain of research. Yeah. However, it's funded, uh, but that's my view on nuclear fusion. Interesting. Yeah, I thought you were going to be very diplomatic there, but, <laughs> but um, please with that. And it, it is it's you know research is speculative in in nature. Um, final question before we conclude. Carbon taxation for driving decarbonisation in the power sector. Uh, so you know, some economists say, well, let's not worry too much about contracts for difference or 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 you know, s- renewable subsidies. We just need a carbon price. So, do you think carbon taxation for driving decarbonisation in the power sector is overrated or underrated? I think uh, it's uh, underrated, uh, but I would expand uh, more generally to decarbonisation. Uh, that is to say that uh, today, if you heat your home with gas and you produce emissions, uh, that doesn't make a difference if you heat your home with you know, a green alternative, for example. Uh, and uh, um, so I think that uh, the impact that uh, um, uh, the actions of everybody in, in the country has on the climate change gases uh, is something that eventually will have to be considered. It's a, it's a huge transition as a, as a system, but you know uh, there, there will be a moment where this carbon taxation needs to be expanded to further activities, etc., yeah. to drive the type of behaviors and answers that we need. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And it's just, there is just so much complexity. Uh, it, it feels like without a pri- if you're relying on someone in central government to pull every right lever, it, it becomes pretty pretty tricky. Um, yeah. that's a natural time to finish Simone so so uh, thank you very much for your candor your expertise as, as I said I think we're all watching your progress because there are huge implications for the UK and Europe and the rest of the world so uh, Simona Rossi thanks so much for taking the time to speak thank you John that was Aurora's co-founder and chief executive John Federson talking to Simona Rossi, CEO of EDF Energy. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.